Hello, and welcome to the Flick in the Frame. This is Omniversity, the show where we take a character and break down its entire history through various forms of media and condense it all into one video. I'm Ty. And I'm Ryan. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Blue Beetle. Uh, his movie just recently made its box office debut to a pretty abysmal opening and run overall but it will be coming to streaming here pretty soon and that's what this is we're making a little primer video for you guys out there who didn't catch it and it's cinema release are you excited uh i'll be honest with you ryan i'm not super excited for what, the blue, what? Beetle movie. blue beetle uh, you're not excited for iconic comic book character blue beetle to make his big screen debut it's just it's just a mixture of blue beetle a character who i just really haven't ever cared about all too much and my overall cynicism on the dc universe <laughs> um i just i'm not super excited about it but i am willing to give it a chance i think the general public agrees with you on their level of excitement what a, what a shot in the dark too i mean like this character nobody really knows it's like the third version of this character yes. right using that as like the jumping off point to yeah, restart yeah. The, the dc universe well, and like let's use blue beetle i mean jaime ray is arguably is the, though the probably the most interesting iteration of that character by a long shot but we're gonna get into it today that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about today we're talking about blue beetle doing a retrospective on his publication history throughout the various publishers that he has been around with. And let me tell you, he's been around uh, quite a lot. The the rabbit hole that we went down on this research, you know, for this video was actually nuts because originally we wanted to just read the 1967 yeah. comic. And we it was were going to read the Steve Ditko 1967 Blue Beetle number one. And we did read it. We read it together. It was very cute. It was awful. It was terrible. It was, it was so boring. It was so bad. I was, I was struggling for ideas on how to, to like convert this into a video. I really mm -hmm. was. But while looking for stuff, you know, we found all this information and I've never done research like that in my life, really. Where like <laughs> I kind of just I fell into something, especially something that I'm not that interested yeah. in. Being Ty, Ty put more movie. effort into this than he did his entire high school degree. Oh, easily. A hundred percent. It wasn't even close, but uh, I mean, we just—I just feel like I learned so much, yeah. and um, you know, I'm excited to share it. So, well, we got some interesting stuff to talk about today. We're going to be talking about kind of the the origins of the character, kind of how he came about, all the different writers and artists involved in his creation, his different publishers that he went through over the years. You know, the the rights kind of traded hands through various different comic publishers all the way back since the late '30s. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of who Blue Beetle was, you know, his first iteration, what he became later on, and what he is nowadays, and kind of his impact on pop culture and media in general. We're going to be breaking down the character of Blue Beetle throughout all the different eras of comic books. We're going to be looking at the Golden Age Blue Beetle, the Silver Age Blue Beetle, the other Silver Age Blue Beetle, on into the Bronze Age, into the Modern Age, and all the various iterations and different people who have been the character over the years. Uh, so starting off, we're doing the Golden Age Blue Beetle, Dan Garrett, 1T. That'll come into play later. This was the first version of the Blue Beetle. He was not only featured in media in a comic book, but also in a weekly radio serial. Okay. Uh, but that was broadcast in 1940. Blue Beetle made his first appearance in Mystery Men Comics number one, 1939, same year as Batman. This was actually, fun fact, also the debut of infamous comic book character, The Green Mask. Are you familiar with The Green Mask, Ty? I'm not familiar with the green mask. He's not related to uh, Jim Carrey yeah, in any no. way. He was published by Fox Comics originally. They were the ones who had the original rights to the Blue Beetle character. Uh, it was created by Charles Nicholas. After after doing some digging in yeah. Charles Nicholas. Lots of digging. <laughs> in fact, Charles Nicholas was actually a pseudonym. It wasn't a real person. It was uh, created in the 30s at uh, Will Eisner's comic packaging company, um, Eisner and Eager, I believe. Eager, yes. Yeah, Eager, like yeah. yeah. Um, but in in like this era of comic books. Uh, the golden age, some yeah, would say. Yeah, the golden age, exactly. All of the artist's work were kind of owned by the the publishers of the of the books, and they would use 
pseudonyms uh, at the different publishing houses as a way to kind of keep the artist from yeah. laying claim to their work. Call them house names. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was kind of some sleazy stuff. But this particular pseudonym, uh, Charles Nicholas, was used by three different famous comic book artists and writers. One being Charles Wachkowski, another being Chuck Quadera, and actually the last one being Jack Kirby. Big, big name. Uh, big name. And he, you know, he had a very short tenure at Fox Comics. You know, mm. It was only a couple of months long. But the whole time he was there, he was under the name Charles Nicholas. Yeah. Chuck Cadera was, um, he was like an artist on the early Black Beetle comics. Black Beetle. A uh, Black Blue Beetle. <laughs> Blue Beetle comics. He was an artist on the early Blue Beetle comics. Um, he has some claim to creating Blue Beetle as well. But Wojciechowski is mainly credited with creating the Blue Beetle. Right, right, right. Uh, Wojciechowski actually had to sell those rights to kind of raise money for himself. Comic book writing in the 30s, early 40s wasn't exactly a lucrative business. And he sold those to Will Eisner, who is credited as co-creator of the Blue Beetle. Right, right. And... So Dan Garrett, he actually, he started off, his dad was a cop, murdered in the line of duty. He decides to follow in his father's footsteps. He then became a cop slash vigilante who used a drug called vitamin 2X to fight crime. During World War II, Garrett was sent on secret missions overseas. A lot of his uh, villains being a variety of various different German weirdos, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. like, likely due to the fact that it was... World War II, and everyone hated the Nazis and, and, and the Germans. But after the war, Dan Garrett, he would later go on to return to his, uh, his neighborhood, become your local everyday cop uh, with an alter ego, a bulletproof suit, and drugs. Performance-enhancing drugs. Yes, as was the trend of that era. Towards the end of the run, he actually saw a lot of gaps in his publication. There would be months, sometimes a year in between, different issues being published, uh, just the character wasn't very popular. It wasn't selling well. It was, you know, already hard enough to produce so many issues of a comic book and send them out nationwide already. It wasn't really worth it to be printing this guy, right. you know. So. This guy who didn't really have much traction in the first place. Right, so. right. He never really has. He never really has. But uh, the mid nineteen fifties, Fox Comics, they uh, they went out of business. They sold some leftover issues, unpublished by their publishing company, to Charlton Comics, uh, who would then later publish these stories as backup issues in their other various series that they had running around at the time. Okay, that's pretty neat. Charlton Comics has like a pretty rich history too. Lots uh, of stuff going on there. Even outside of just Blue yeah. Beetle. But Charles and Comics actually, they were formed in 1945. They published all different kinds of things. Uh, they published like romance, horror, sci-fi, superhero comic books, as you know, a lot of the different publishers back then did. Uh, but anyways, Charlton Comics, they, uh, they are going to actually try their hand at some original Dan Garrett with one T Blue Beetle comics. Uh, they actually ran four issues. Uh, his powers grew. He gained the ability of flight and x-ray vision after a while. This actually, these powers were later taken away because superheroes kind of fell out of fashion in the uh, in the early 50s, late mid 40s. It kind of just flailed out of existence. It just as, came and it went. As Blue Beetle is wont to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of lots of flailing. Lots of low sales and low interest. Uh, but that didn't stop the Blue Beetle there. Uh, in the 1960s, superheroes hit it big again. The Silver Age was in full swing. Charles and Comics, they decided they were going to give the character a fresh new name, new backstory. They're going to get him back into the spotlight or put him in there in the first place because he never really has been. I love this. I love it so much. Uh, his new name is Dan Garrett, this time with two Ts. That's right. And there's actually a canon reason as to why he has the second T in oh, his name now. Lay it on me, lay it on me. We'll talk about it a little later. But oh, no. they've reimagined him completely. He's got an extra T in his name. He's got a new backstory. He's got a new job. He's now a university professor by day. Vigilante archaeologist by night. Okay, that's kind yeah. of sick. Never mind you of anybody, Ryan. A little Indiana Jones. A little, a little Indiana yeah. Jones. You put the fedora on him. It would. It yeah, would. Okay. You, you give you him would, a whip. Yeah, if you squint, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell the film apart, really. 
So they reimagined him a little bit, similar costume, not too different. But now, instead of his powers coming from drugs, because that's that's a big no-no uh, in the 60s, <laughs> you know, just with the hippie culture and right. the, the counterculture movement and all that. Yeah, sure. no more drugs. Instead, he is an archaeologist who discovers a mystical scarab while excavating a site in Egypt. Scarab kind of essentially bonds with him uh, and gives him all sorts of different powers, and he's running around and doing Blue Beetle stuff again. Blue Beetle is back, baby. Uh, the series was revitalized by writers Joe Gill and Roy Thomas, uh, but it never really seemed to get off the ground, uh, even with all the changes to the uh, Blue Beetle mythos. Dan Garrett's second run as the Blue Beetle was very short-lived, ending in 1966 when the character went on hiatus, seemingly an indefinite amount of time. As Blue Beetle... Is yeah, what to do. He's always coming and going, that guy. Here we go. New Blue Beetle time. All different, all new Blue Beetle, baby. It's the late 1960s. Charlton Comics is going for a massive relaunch, leaning heavily into the booming superhero trend of that era. Yeah, the 60s were just massive for superheroes. Yeah. There's so many iconic heroes coming from that Lots of time different period. things happening. I mean, that's when Marvel really started getting off the ground with mm -hmm. their stuff. Uh, Batman, you know, had his TV show and then in the 60s, yeah, it really boosted his yeah. popularity as well. So comics were back, baby. Charlton Comics editor Dick Giordano brought in talent like Steve Ditko, Jim Aparo, Dennis O'Neill, and Steve Skeets to help Charlton compete with the two big dogs, Marvel and DC. They came together, they created the Action Heroes basically uh, reimagining and creating new iconic characters, characters like The Question, Captain Adam, Nightshade, Peacemaker, and Judo Master, uh, Steve Ditko, uh, we mentioned earlier, original Spider-Man, Doctor Strange artist, mm -hmm. big career over at Marvel. I mean, oh, yeah. super, super yes. influential. At this time, though, Steve Ditko, he would reimagine a new version of the Blue Beetle, that being Ted Cord Blue Beetle. He would make his first appearance in Captain Adam number 83 and would, you know, make backup appearances uh, into Captain Adam number 86. Seemingly, his popularity kind of grew uh, in those backup issues of Captain Adam. He uh, then got his own five-issue run in 1967. Ted Cord, very, very different from Dan Garrett. Well, not too different. Uh, he's actually a student of Dan Garrett. No powers, just genius intellect. Creates a variety of, like, different kind of tech-based weapons and gadgets to help him make up for the fact that he you know yeah. doesn't have any superpowers he had, that, he had that goofy like light ray in the in the comic that, that just kind of blinds people uh okay <laughs> that classic blinding <laughs> ray that the blue beetle uses well arguably his most iconic piece of uh like tech is the bug uh oh, which his, his big scarab ship yeah actually that's pretty cool it's like an all-purpose flying submarine hover car situation yeah. like it's it's all over the place I, I definitely get it and it is it, the design is actually pretty neat especially yeah. for something this early on it might be that the most unique draw of that character and what i thought was really interesting about that steve Dicko issue number one we read from 1967 is it looks very much like biologically close to an actual beetle mm -hmm. and then later on like versions of the ship are much more like simplified and, right. and not as like beetle esque. I also think that the the upgrade from the Dan Garrett suit to the Ted Cord suit way better. Like I think the Ted Cord suit definitely much more of an iconic look, but not that iconic. I still kind of like the Ted Cord suit to this day. I like the Ted Cord suit mm -hmm. even in comparison to Jaime Reyes's suit. It's obviously not quite as neat but i think it still has like a it still holds its own it, I mean, it, Reyes it's, does it's, have a cool suit it is a great suit yeah. <laughs> yeah actually uh dan garrett when he first debuted he had more of like a green hornet-esque kind of costume and to avoid you know similarity between them the creators kind of decided to shift him into the more like almost uh like the phantom-esque look so you know Dan Garrett has never really had an original look, which I think just makes Jaime's, you know, all the better for being an original design and concept. For this issue, though, Ditko actually did the illustrating, inking, and the scripting uh, for this entire five-issue series, but chose to not be credited as the writer. Uh, so uh, editor of Charles and Comics, Dick Giordano, asked DC Glansman if they could credit him as writer instead. Uh, 
Uh, but Charlton Comics wasn't done with Dan Garrett just yet. It was revealed in the second issue of 1967 Blue Beetle series that the two had partnered together to investigate Jarvis Cord, Ted's uncle. Jarvis was attempting to build an android army to take over the world. Uh, in their attempt to stop him, Dan Garrett was killed and passed on the mantle of Blue Beetle to Ted. Uh, at the time, the scarab that provided Dan his powers was seemingly lost, but it was later retconned in DC Comics that Ted actually recovered the scarab, but just couldn't get it to work for him. Cord would later team up with characters such as The Question and Captain Adam throughout his years with the mantle. Uh, he would be a part of Charlton's major superhero team, the Sentinels of Justice. This was kind of like Charlton's Justice League. They're Fantastic Four, right. almost. Although the character never really kind of springboarded back into the spotlight. Uh, if he was ever in it, am I right? <laughs> uh, after Charlton's relaunch, though, it wasn't enough to keep the series going. And the character was put back on hiatus in 1968. I don't know how many times I could make this joke, but as Blue Beetle is wont to do... <laughs> Yeah. So the uh, the rights would get shifted around again in 1983. Uh, the, he had a brief run under Amera Comics, also known as AC Comics. Dan Garrett with two T's. He was actually brought back from the dead. Uh, it was revealed that a group of unnamed gods that were connected to his mystical scarab reincarnated Dan Garrett with one T, who was the Golden Age Blue okay. Beetle into Dan Garrett with two T's. It was then that Ted ends up giving up the mantle of Blue Beetle back to Garrett. Now, this run is not important at all. You can literally throw this in the trash. I don't think anything from this has made it into any bit of continuity at all. No. Basically, the status quo, despite it being changed entirely, was not changed. And the next time that we see Blue Beetle was in DC Comics. Uh, in 1983, Charlton, they were going out of business. The rights ended up with DC. Alan Moore actually wanted to use these Charlton Comics characters for Watchmen. Uh, that was kind of his initial idea he had at first, and he wanted to adapt the Charlton Comics characters into that story, but DC told him, Oh, ooh, Alan Moore, sorry. Uh, these characters, yeah, they're going to be iconic, memorable DC characters. We can't have you kind of tarnishing their legacy and their name with your nitty-gritty, realistic take on superheroes and whatnot. Uh, so they told him no. Alan Moore ended up basing the characters in Watchmen on these Charlton Comics characters instead. And actually, funnily enough, uh, Grant Morrison in 2014, he would go on to write a comic book series called Multiversity. And there was an issue that was called Pax Americana Number no. 1. And in this storyline, uh, the Charlton comics characters are put into like a Watchmen-esque storyline uh, like Alan Moore originally wanted to do. It's very interesting. Uh, but anyways, in 1986, Blue Beetle, once again, see a return to the page. Ted Cord Blue Beetle specifically, uh, that old stuff with Dan Garrett didn't happen. All gone. Get it out of here. It was written by Lynn Ween, uh, credited for reviving the X-Men, one of the co-creators of Wolverine and Swamp Thing. Uh, it was a 24-issue run with art by Paris Collins. This run was mostly a way to kind of introduce the Charlton character into the DC universe. Uh, but it also established Ted as a billionaire CEO of his own company, Court Industries, very uh, very Bruce Wayne-esque in that aspect. Uh, the series would lay the groundwork for this version of Ted Cord that is featured in the DC Universe to this very day. Uh, we actually even saw the return of Dan Garrett with two T's once more. Uh, in Blue Beetle Volume 6, number 18 in 1987, Dan Garrett returns on a rampage. He's out of control. He's throwing cars in the street. He trying to find Ted Core Blue Beetle. He wants to take the mantle back. They end up fighting in the streets, just causing a mess everywhere they go. In this issue, the idea of the scarab being alien is introduced. Okay. Uh, it's seemingly, though, destroyed along with Dan Garrett after he's blasted with some weird ray that gives him all of his memories back. And then he has like a mental battle with the scarab and he ends up just believing in himself hard okay. enough and they both die. It's like a reverse, like total recall, Ray. Like it's, it just gives him all his memories yeah, back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, the scarab explodes, definitely. It's gone. 
or so it seems. Uh, Cord would later go on, though, to be featured in the Justice League series that ran from 1987 to 1994, was later rebranded as Justice League International. This is where he would frequently team up with his best friend, the cutest couple in all of DC Comics, <laughs> Booster Gold, uh, classic blue and gold team up. Everybody loves to see it. And this would take us right into the modern age. Uh, yeah, in the modern age, he kind of falls out of favor once again around after Justice League. You know, as he that, does, as he does, as <laughs> he is wont to do. Uh, in the mid '90s, we just don't really see all that much of him. Uh, he made a couple appearances in uh, Extreme Justice with Booster Gold. Yeah, and that and was when, extreme oh, justice. Yeah, it, was, it was some extreme levels of justice. So extreme. Uh, justice League relaunched in 97 uh, with a more classic roster mm -hmm. with Grant Morrison writing that he also made multiple appearances in. In the early 2000s, he kind of popped up here and there in some Birds of Prey issues. Prior to Infinite Crisis, which was, you know, was a big event in the mid 2000s. Big deal. Big deal. Uh, Ted Cord discovers there's this organization called Checkmate that's up to a bunch of you know crazy stuff, and he tries to tell the Justice League about it. They don't really take him too seriously, and he goes to actually confront the leader of Checkmate, Maxwell Lord. Bad guy. Bad guy. Where he is killed in Countdown to Infinite Crisis, the one shot released in 2005. After Countdown to Infinite Crisis. Thankfully, we're not done with Blue Beetle yet. Not and just yet. Not no. just yet. It's time for a new version. 3.0, baby. 3.0. And I think that, and I feel like most people would agree with me, this is kind of the definitive Blue Beetle. This is the Blue Beetle that most people associate with the character, the one that most people find the most interesting. Probably uh, has the most, like, media. Like, yeah, he's uh, in like, the most stuff. Yeah. And I think it'd just be really tough to argue that any other Blue Beetle comes close to his level. He of... was my first Blue Beetle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I grew up with, with Jaime. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember watching Batman the Brave and the Bold uh, mm -hmm. in like the late 2000s and, you know, him making appearances in that and having, mm -hmm. you know, kind of overarching storyline in that show. And yeah. and then Young Justice later on. Oh, I'll would, get into would... all that. Oh, right? yeah. I'll okay. get into all well, that. He was in, he was in some Justice. things you might not have even have known that he was in. Oh, so yeah, in 2006, we see the introduction of Jaime Reyes, who is a teenager from El Paso, Texas. We're from Texas. Oh, wait, <laughs> We're from Texas. Should I say that? Uh, no. <laughs> In 2006, we get an introduction to this third Blue Beetle in Jaime Reyes, who kind of stumbles across Dan Garrett's Scarab in just, a parking lot. He just finds it. He just finds it. Yeah. He just finds it. And, you know, he goes to sleep later that night, and the Scarab fuses with him. And uh, we kind of learn through that that the Scarab originates from this alien population called the Reach, who are like, like space warmongers. Jaime would later go on to make appearances in Teen Titans comics and subsequently become a member of the Teen Titans. His solo series was written by Keith Giffen and John Rogers. It lasted about 36 issues before getting canceled once again due to low sales and interest in the character. Yeah, yeah. Classic blue Beetle. <laughs> Jaime then goes to make some appearances with both other versions of Blue Beetle in Booster Gold Volume 2. And he had a pretty big recurring guest role in the Booster Gold comics between 2009 and 2010. Over the course of this run, the Scarab slowly kind of develops a personality of its own. It's actually revealed that the Scarab has completely severed itself from the Reach's hive mind. In that same you know, late 2000s era, all three versions of the character pop up in Batman the Brave and the Bold that you Love mentioned it. before. Um, I don't believe that Dan Garrett or Ted Kord had voice actors. I'll have to double check that. Mm. But Jaime Reyes did. And he did, as you said, have a, have a pretty nice I, arc. I think they had a voice actor for the Ted Kord. I don't Maybe remember Ted Dan Kord Garrett. had one, but I, Dan Garrett was definitely silent. Mm. Well, well, probably because he, probably he would have said something racist. Right, he, he would have said something stupid or racist, you know, <laughs> typical 30s stuff. <laughs> this is one that, you know, you might not be super familiar because not everyone watched this show. Um, but both Jaime and Ted actually do make appearances in the CW TV show Smallville. I watched Smallville. You watched Smallville? Yes. Okay, not everyone watched Smallville. I remember Smallville. the Jaime Reyes episode. I thought it was cool. It the costume actually not bad not bad for a tv budget no yeah. not at all it was it. like 2000 and like 
eight. I was maybe? a kid, and I remember thinking like that's badass. Yeah, like I like that. But yeah, in Smallville, he was just like a kid who got bullied until he got the scarab. You know, they kind of. You know, and he went and showed those bullies who was boss. Exactly. So I'm the exactly. blue beetle now. <laughs> After all this, we kind of move into a pretty lukewarm era of DC, and not a lot of people liked it. Some people did. It had its positives, but it had a lot more negatives, mm. and that's the New 52. Yeah. Um, so in 2011, DC rebooted again with the New 52 reboot, and it brought a lot of changes to the entire DC universe. Yeah. Jaime Reyes was one that received a pretty decent change. Tony Bedard was given kind of the helm on this project, and he completely erased Garrett and Cord from the Blue Beetle mythos and just focused exclusively on Jaime. It only lasted about 16 issues. I'm sure what, fans were upset. Yeah, I mean, what a surprise, a Blue Beetle comic only makes it a year two years he gets eight more a little bit later on a book called threshold where uh keith giffen the original writer for jaime uh comes back and writes those there were also plans for a jeff johns led blue beetle tv series oh, jeff um, johns of green lantern, green lantern fame yeah. very very popular dc comic book writer yeah that was being kind of pitched around they showed off uh trailers i don't know if you caught these when they were on but like in 2012 oh. there was a big push of like dc stuff on cartoon network yeah i remember and they showed like a teaser trailer of this blue beetle tv show and that's the only thing we've ever received from it like really? after that trailer we received no further updates on it and it's just kind of assumed that it fell apart yeah I, I don't remember that i remember that big like dc animation push on cartoon network because mm -hmm. it was like saturday mornings would be new episodes of green lantern and young justice i missed this but i'm gonna definitely go ahead and find it because like it had to have been terrible how bad could it be for them yeah. to, to, to take that teaser trailer and then completely drop the project especially one that's being you know at the time like jeff johns could do no wrong mm. so i just don't understand how that doesn't take maybe it, take, take off maybe know? there will be footage of that trailer in this video who knows maybe it's playing over the top of our voices maybe right it's now there right maybe now. they can see it and we just have to imagine it <laughs> oh can you imagine how oh, bad it is it's horrendous it's so bad Ew. <laughs> it's probably okay <laughs> but despite all of that terribleness in 2013 uh we get arguably the most popular form of jaime reyes and the one that i'm most familiar with um, and that is Young Justice, yeah. um, the character voiced by Eric Lopez. Oh, love Young Justice. It's a great show. So good. It really is. And Beetle is a great part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, they really do his like his, a full arc for him in yeah, season two. It's huge. Like, it's yeah, massive. Yeah. In that arc, we find out obviously that the scarab is alien in origin again. Mm -hmm. You know his mm -hmm. connection to the Reach. But also, I'm not sure how it plays into the main comics universe, but in Young Justice, it's not only an alien, but when it crash lands on Earth, it comes in contact with like these ancient magicians, like mystics, and they alter the purpose of it and help to sever that connection from the Reach. Mm. So it's alien in origin, but it has been magically you know, altered. Right, right. So, so that that kind of retcon is like in line with the history of the scarab. It connects everything. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like it started as a mystical object and then it became right. alien and now it's it's both and I, alien I like and that. mystical. Yeah, I like yeah. that connection. I think it really brings it together. I think if you make it work within the confines of like the narrative then like, yeah, whatever. But if you're just changing it and saying like, oh no, this never happened. Right. Yeah, right. that's that's no good. Yeah. Once again, he kind of goes on a small hiatus. I don't think there was anything, you know, massive this time around, no. but there just wasn't huge demand for the character. So they just kind of took a break because of the overall failure of the new 52. DC rebooted pretty quickly after this again yeah. in 2016 um, with a much better reboot, in my opinion. Uh, it still has its issues, but I think yeah. it's a far better attempt at what they were doing. Keith Giffen comes back. Yeah. You know, the original writer, which was good because that means that the character is going to be treated with a little bit of you know respect for what he was. It puts some respect on his name. Exactly. Mm. Uh, Giffen brings back cord and garrett into like the oh, timeline okay. so thankfully that yeah, cool. that wasn't gone for too long and he actually brings back a revived ted cord to be a mentor figure to jaime oh. so he's got someone to kind of teach him how to be blue beetle so did they did they just bring dan garrett back into canon or did they bring him back to life uh to answer your question it does 
mention him in the comics in the canon you know specifically brings up that the scarab that jaime fuses with is the one that was owned by dan garrett right um but uh, i do believe that it was just kind of a mention jaime reyes does have uh dan garrett's granddaughter as one of like his like side characters that person exists but i guess maybe dan garrett is you know dan he's, he's long dead, dead. yeah, yeah. If it brings back the whole story of cord and garrett i imagine that it just kind of re-canonizes right that dan garrett you know died it's probably what's happening before, here yeah uh, to pass on the mantle to mm-hmm. to ted cord this run would last only for about 18 issues it would end in 2018 in that same year Uh, Jaime appears in a short-lived animated series called Justice League Action. I didn't mind Justice League Action. Uh, I missed Justice League Action. Had uh, Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy. Okay, okay. Uh, He was voiced by J.T. Austin, who, you know, was on uh, Wizards of Waverly Place. Oh. If you remember that. Uh, I never got into it. He was Max. Oh, Max. Yeah, Yeah, what a character. Jaime also appears as a playable character in a really, really popular NetherRealm Studios game, Injustice 2, Hmm. where he has a pretty decent uh, chunk of the stories dedicated to him. You know, it's pretty good. I like the uh, the design, like all the different modifications you can make to him and whatnot. Jaime Reyes also makes an appearance in the Injustice 2 comic book run by Tom Taylor, which ran from 2017 to 2018. In early 2021, Jaime gets a limited series titled Graduation Day, where after graduating from high school, he moves to Palmera City and eventually has to stop a conflict between the Reach, the alien civilization that his scarab comes from, and another alien civilization, and then eventually invites the Reach to stay with him in Palmer City. Yeah. We really get to see him kind of coming into his own right. as a hero as opposed to just being yeah. a teen titan. They're definitely making like big leaps with him, which kind of leads us into, you know, what's happening nowadays in 2022 with the dawn of DC. That's like the current iteration of DC Comics at time of recording. Uh, we haven't really seen too much from this era as of yet. It kind of spawns out of this event known as Dark Crisis. Overall, we're still kind of seeing the continuation of like the rebirth mm-hmm timeline and and growing that because there's only one issue so far right? only one issue at time of mm-hmm. recording so interested to see where it goes in late 2021 we get a little break from Jaime Reyes and Ted Cord is brought back into action with his longtime best friend Booster Gold in a limited run titled Blue and Gold and this was actually written by the original Booster Gold creator Dan Jurgens it's kind of another attempt to push Blue Beetle in popularity. Yeah, well, you know, after doing all of this Blue Beetle research and de- taking a deep dive on the character like we have, like, I'm kind of interested to read more now. I would be really excited if Blue Beetle gained himself some fame. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that just kind of bleeds into what we've been talking about here and the whole idea of, like, it seems like Blue Beetle has never really caught fire like Mm -hmm. his writers and artists and publishers have really wanted. It seems like every time that he makes it into the spotlight, he's forced into it, and then it never really pays off. And it's because he's like a cheap imitation of things that we've seen before. Right. With the more modern Jaime Reyes stuff, it's, it's, it, I find it a little, you know, strange that he doesn't have that level of popularity because he's got mm-hmm. an interesting enough backstory. The yeah. character is interesting and unique. The scarab just keeps getting more interesting as well. Has lots of powers. Lots of powers. It, 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 he's got all the pieces. It just won't come together. Yeah. Well, it seems like, you know, they're trying to market him a little bit like Spider-Man in the sense that, like, he's like the teen superhero, you know, but it just, for whatever reason, it's not catching, you know, who knows? My final evaluation on Blue Beetle, he's a character who has been forced into the spotlight several times throughout his narrative publication, and it seems like they always try to adapt him to be, like, what's popular. You know, they'll give him Superman's powers, or they'll make him, like, have alien origins, or they'll make him a tech CEO like Bruce Wayne. It's just, he never really seems to, you know, bring a lot of originality to the table, and I think that's why... You know, he never really catches like the publishers are expecting is because he just isn't those things that he's trying to be. I think that it is a glaring issue if the most interesting part of your character, the part of your character that I had the most fun researching and talking about was the many, 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 many different changes that were made to it and Mm. and people who owned it and people who were writing on it or people who drew it or you know retcons to the character but 
not the story of that character. I guess it just goes to show that he hasn't left too much of a, you know, a mark. He doesn't have his own little place kind of carved out in comics yeah. yet, at least to me. But going through this, I did have a ton of fun uh, just kind of analytically learning new stuff, uh, which was not really what I was expecting from this. So it was a little bit of a journey. This has been Omniversity. We really appreciate you watching this video. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, we plan on doing more of these character studies soon, so like, subscribe, and comment what you'd like to see next. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.